So guys, uh, my name is Jasper. I'm really, really excited to be here and um, somehow Matt invited me to come over and uh, I asked him a million times, are you sure? But um, this is what I wanted to talk about. A bit of, uh, uh, Matt asked me to tell me, uh, to tell a bit about my story and how PostLab came to be. So I'm gonna include some stuff about what I've been doing so far, what I've built, what we, and how we used to work at the, my former employee. But first about, my, about me, I travel all the way like that, from that small country over there. You guys wouldn't even call it a country if you compare it to Canada. <laughs> it's probably the size of a lake, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, where I live, and to be specific, in a town called Ada, yeah. So, and um, uh, I am here because since we're now in the map, I used to work there in Hilversum, and Hilversum is sort of the media capital of the Netherlands. And I used to work here at the, the AO, or EO. It's an uh, evangelical broadcaster in the Netherlands. It's a, part, uh, it's a public broadcaster, so we get funded by the government. In Holland, we've got this quite unique uh, system that the more paying members you have, the more broadcast time you get. And uh, we were part of that. And um, so what is it? Um, it's a public broadcaster, as I mentioned. It's pretty old already. And we did uh, TV, radio, magazines, and uh, events. Huge events, football stadiums full of young people and concerts and that sort of thing. And um, it had around 400 employees, not as many, uh, many as uh, some of you guys here. And um, around 400,000 paying members. So, and I was uh, responsible in the beginning for uh, the office side of things and later on uh, uh, for the post-production side of things. Now, I was really curious how many people uh, are working in the post-production area here because or media and entertainment, you know, great, great. Okay, um, a lot of you don't, make sure you do because it's one of the most awesome fields there is. You're always working with cutting edge technology, you know. When you think you've got it all together, they introduce something as 4K and everything has to be four times the size and how do you do it with bandwidth and, and that sort of thing. Um, it's also, uh, a, a really different area to work in, um, especially with the, with the users. Uh, editors are a kind of breed that, well, when you put them under stress, they tend to uh, get noisy. And, um, and uh, you work a lot with deadlines because something has to be broadcasted. And uh, then it's often leave everything you're doing with and run along with the editor and make sure it happened. And, uh, it, it works. So um, our post-production environment, that's mainly the thing I'm gonna talk about and share some things on how we did that. And another click, there it is. So we used, uh, we were beta testers of XN and running uh, XN on a, a beta test in production wasn't a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> we had many, many adventures there. <laughs> So uh, as soon as Apple decided to ditch the X, X serve, we uh, uh, thought, okay, we're gonna do, go for Stornex, which is basically the same. Stornex still feels the pain of uh, licensing it out to Apple. It used to be a thousand euros per client and in each and every one of your MacBooks, there is a Stornex license in it. So use it sometime if you can. Um, uh, we had two volumes of those about 240 terabytes usable each. And we are, we're using a DAC Alto, which is an alternative for LTO as our archive. And uh, so basically there were a lot of disk in the, it's a tank of a server. It's really the longest server you've ever seen. But the disk would, would spin down when not in use, just a bit like tape. And as soon as you use a file, the disk would spin up again. So your disk would have a really long lifetime. At least that's what that's the idea, and uh, the archive was also replicated to another area. We also had a, a NAS 
I didn't include it here, but we had a we were in an old convent. You, you, perhaps you've seen that on the picture. And so we had a server room on the other side and the, another server room on the other side and one stand over there and one stand over there. As we call, creatively call them production A, production B. And um, uh, we had a NAS on the other side of town. So the rule of thumb is always make sure you have three copies and uh, in two different locations and you only work for one. That's what we did. We had around uh, 12 edit sets or suites, and um, those were all full on, like uh, um, every set was exactly the same. This was something we set out to do. We had a couple of bigger ones with a couch and where you could do uh, record voiceovers, but uh, um, we, we, you could direct your, the, 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 the booth where you would do the voiceover uh, to each edit set. Uh, for ingest sets, so um, ingesting is uh, um, the process of offloading your camera footage, perhaps transcoding it and putting it in the right place on the sand and everything that's surrounding it uh, for broadcast. So just, uh, we call it the machinery of machine room. And uh, it was the heart of uh, the, our post-production. We had two audio sets, so for audio uh, after effects and stuff like that. Um, five spot sets, and what we mean with that, we had all over the company little booths where they could, uh, producers could watch what has been created. So uh, they were all also connected to Fiber Channel, and, um, and uh, some people, uh, like uh, we had a promo editor, had one. And so we got, we got a lot of them, and there were about 10 servers. And those servers uh, were doing, for example, network home folders. I know probably some of you get a cold spine right now. <laughs> and, uh, but actually, uh, when uh, network home folders run on AFP, it was awesome. Never had any problems. As soon as Apple decided, let's make our own SMB. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so a lot. And we ended up actually um, building our own. Uh, we were running CentOS, finally. And we uh, built our own uh, network fill over uh, a home folder system with uh, a cluster FS and a stone it procedure. So if one would die, you'd still have your network home folders up and running. And uh, it's, it's a feature that's, it will come back up. We've learned that. It's a feature that uh, when it really works, it's awesome. Everybody has their own home folder. Everybody has their own little sandbox they could mess up and they don't mess up your entire system. And um, we use that a lot. And there was also, um, yeah, well, there are not many post-production people here, but some of the applications like motion, you've got motion templates, they can only run when they're inside your home folder. So I don't know why, but you got to deal with it. So uh, those sort of things you had to, we had to deal with. We also had, obviously, a lot of transcoding machines because we needed to do a lot of transcoding. And during the night, we used those machines for backing up our SAN. I'm going to talk about that in a little while. Uh, we had a MAM. A MAM is a media asset management system. Don't use one if you don't need one. Um, we finally ended up using this as a front end to our archive that people could simply search for an episode or a clip or a photo and retrieve that from our archive storage back to the sun. And uh, a lot of file sharing coming in to, from out, uh, external producers that we had to, uh, like FTP servers and that sort of thing. And we had many, many scripts and that's part, mainly my uh, undoing. <laughs> um, for all this, we only used Ansible and GitLab as tools. So, sorry, we didn't use Monkey or Monkey Report or all the other tools. We, we used Ansible. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little while as well. Uh, but first, my career. Um, it all started because of an iPod. I would never have chosen IT myself. But uh, I started at the AO back in 2002, I think. Uh, at the customer service desk, and I just bought my first 
iMac, and that was the time that all my friends said, you are crazy of buying an Apple. You know, that, that time, that when you were walking around with your white ear put, every, uh, you were feeling the man, like nobody had them back at the time. <laughs> so uh, um, what I did, I just purchased for $130 Mac OS 10.3 Panther at home, you know, in standing in line, those golden ages. <laughs> and um, I wanted to use that. Uh, at the AO, I had a big clunky eMac weighing 30 kilos, and uh, those were still running on 10.2. And so I installed Mac OS on uh, my iPod. You could do that back in the day and booted up my eMac from the iPod. And uh, so when IT saw that, they say, OK, uh, perhaps you're more interested in working for us, because uh, especially back in the day, everybody who went to uh, college for IT, knew nobody had ever touched an iPod and uh, knew anything about it, especially since Mac OS X was so young still. So uh, we all had to educate our own people. And um, that's something about education, by the way. Um, so I started uh, working there. And first, I, um, I did a lot of, lot of things over the years. I worked there for 17 years, I guess. And, um, what I really love, and perhaps you recognize that as well, about, especially in the beginning days, we had to figure it out everything by ourselves. And it was um, a lot of, uh, like modern Lego, you know? Okay, let's build this and try to that. And it was really awesome, exciting times. And um, uh, one of the first projects I got, I don't know if you remember the very old version of uh, server app. They're actually called server admin and workgroup manager, I think. And in the server admin, we actually used that as our uh, DHCP server. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we had MAC address filtering uh, on it for, for the entire. And it was, it, it was the day before people had smartphones. So OK, you could do that. And, um, but on top of the MAC address list was a radio button called allow the following MAC addresses or deny the following MAC addresses. And one day my colleague pressed the deny button and nobody knew about it. <laughs> so after a while nobody had internet access and uh, we finally discovered what it was. So my boss said, I want to have a better DHCP server. So what do you do? You go to Linux. So. Um, I ended up building a DHCP D server and a name D server for our DNS and a netboot and a net install in a failover and a load balance scenario. And uh, I wasn't an experienced programmer back then. So I built it in flipping FileMaker. What about that? <laughs> <laughs> so you got your, we had our list. This was back in 2004, yeah? so come on. Um, Everything sounded sexy when it started with an I, so I network we called it. And um, <laughs> so this was our, our, our inventory list. And when you had a computer, you could actually say, OK, I wanted to have in that subnet. And uh, it would actually check how many uh, leases it got, IP leases. So if your computer didn't get a lease for six weeks, you got disabled. And after 10 weeks, you got removed. And um, what else? Oh, yeah, we could say uh, DHCP or static IP address, and you could fill in your uh, DNS names over there. And uh, we, we had this for a very long time, because tools like this die, don't die easily. Um, we could say here what image it should get and what user should be created. It will actually make, automatically make a backup of the user home for directory, and after install, restore the backup folder. And uh, that was a fun project. I also built a, our own software updater, even before the monkey times, because back in 2004 or 5, uh, we had to do that. Also, uh, multiple servers, and we worked with groups. And the main problem we had was how to install software as a dif different user. So uh, you could fill in the user, the admin user over there. I, I actually don't have any slides anymore about how it looked, but it looked exactly the same, just like uh, Craig showed the other day as Apple's. Um, 
Okay, so now uh, after this, I went to the post production area and we did the whole thing with uh, two, three people. And uh, after a while, I built this. Uh, we call that cluster sync. And uh, as I mentioned before, one of the challenges you have with post production is okay, we have three SANS and a NAS. How do we ever get, or in around, at the time, more than two terabytes of changes each day? How do you keep those in sync? And um, I used to, I built CVCP sync. CVCP is an Exxon specific command to copy really fast uh, from one SAN to another really kick its tail and try to get as much, much bandwidth as possible. But I noticed, hey, you could kick off multiple CVCP syncs and still increase it. So what CVCP sync and later on fast sync was, but fast sync just used CP. What, what, they, what it did was it used R sync to tell me with a dry run, I would do this. And then I would kick off that in batches to copy. So uh, I, I could tweak it all. OK, this machine could handle seven copies at the same, same time. That machine could handle five copies at the same time. It will come back. I have faith. And, um, um, but after a while, the, um, those machines didn't make it through the night. Well, each night, they would start copying. And there was, sometimes, they would still be copying during the day. So what? We ended up doing, we had the, our transcoding cluster wasn't doing anything during the night. So the, those Mac Pros we used to start copying. And um, we had one Linux server who, who, was, who was the master and told each Mac Pro, OK, now you're going to copy that folder. Now you're going to copy that folder. You copy that folder. As soon as the Mac Pro was finished, it would report back, OK, copy this, copy that. And what you can actually see here, it was also managing the copy to the to our NAS. So it would first copy to one SAN to the other SAN. When that was done, it would copy from the backup SAN to our NAS. And we could filter out stuff like this. This directory isn't that important. So you don't copy that to the NAS. Or we could tweak it around. And uh, in the morning, we had this website. So we could see, OK, it's uh, almost uh, halfway, uh, halfway through. And uh, this uh, is the. Uh, the copy to the other SAN, and this is the copy to our NAS. And you could, we could see where it was, because very often people would complain, it's so slow. And you'd find, start searching, searching, oh, it's, the copy was still going on. So that was fun stuff. And uh, I actually had one, this was my sort of first open source project and with one active user, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I got to share something. OK, um, uh, the company decided also we want to use Compressor as our main transcoding tool, which is a really bad idea for you to do. But the reasons were Compressor has excellent quality output files, and they really do. We, in Hilversum, the, 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 the capital, well, media capital of the Netherlands, we were the only broadcaster who could deliver a file exactly as, the, as agreed upon. All the other broadcasters couldn't do that. But Compressor could. So that's a good point. But Compressor is unstable as crap, really. You, you, you look at it, and it fails you. <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding. It does. I just sat here this, uh, and, and looked at it twice, and it didn't work. Um, so I had to figure out a way how to make it stable. And what they also wanted was watch folders. So, an editor would edit, create a short export, but he didn't want to use the CPU power of his machine because he had to, other stuff to edit. So he placed it in a watch folder on the SAN. Compressor server would pick it up, transcode it into whatever it wanted, and bring it back to the output folder. Also, what it also did was uh, when other producers from outside of our company FTP files to us, it would pick those up, transcode it, and place it back to wherever we wanted. So, we had a website where you could see all the files coming in, where they were going, and then how far the, uh, the, the process was. And um, uh, what it also contained in order to fix the, the insanely unstable situation was uh, it a sort of uh, a monitoring. I, I would monitor compressor for suspicious behavior. So if you, uh, 
I would check CPU, I would check, uh, uh, is compressor restarted uh, a day ago or, or, or hours ago? And I would vote that all. And if it counted all the votes counted up, and if the, uh, if the value was above five, I would repair it, or above three, I would. Uh, compressor has repair tools and reset tools. If software has repair or reset tools, don't use it. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but we used that for a while. And uh, actually, last night during Hack Night, it was back in 2016, I thought it would be fun to. Uh, revive the, that project a bit. So I, uh, last night I got a working back on the latest Mac OS and with the latest version of Compressor. So if you're interested, let me know. Uh, this is something that you could do with it, like um, yeah, the watch folder, compressor settings and destination, um, pick up only those files with those extensions, and, or, or um, uh, leave other files in place or uh, copy those files as well to the destination. It will also do uh, um, failover and load balancing. You could set this up on multiple servers and they would know that another compressor server has had picked up the file. Okay. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> so, uh, also when Apple decided to ditch the XServe, we decided to ditch Apple as our uh, platform for servers. And uh, we went all VM on CentOS. And one of the main problems I have with servers th is that they were all, and they were not the same. They were all different. One had their logs over there. One had their uh, uh, executables in another place. And you know how it goes. Everybody, every server looks at it. It's different. And um, I was looking at tools for Puppet and Chef which do, uh, which, which handle this problem and um, couldn't get it to work really the way I wanted. And uh, then I started using Ansible and within two days I had exactly what I wanted and could deploy our service with it. And I was, uh, I'm a real uh, Ansible uh, enthusiast. So I thought, why not do our edit sets environment completely in Ansible? <coughs> so we had one tool where we managed our servers and our edit set, uh, post-production environment in. And um, this is only a good idea for you guys if you have uh, machines with a static IP address and an or a DNS name. And um, because Ansible treats those machines as servers. Um, but the benefits are really, really, really awesome. So you, you don't need any software on your machines, all SSH only. So as, if your machine is, uh, SSH, uh, has SSH, Ansible could configure it. Um, it's all very, very simple YAML files. And we, we said, okay, this is now our documentation. Everybody could read it. If you would read the document, uh, these YAML files, you would know exactly how our machine was installed, what software, where, what configurations we did. And uh, so we didn't have to document again. Hey. Um, uh, Ansible also has a product called Tower for if you want to pay. And if you like open source software, then you have to use Ansible AWX. And apparently that stands for Ansible Works. And um, it is a basically a website uh, where you could have you, multiple users spawn different playbooks, as they call them. And so you have a nice log and history of who did what and when. Still with Ansible, we had sometimes the problem from, why is this working? What happened? No, nobody touched it. And apparently somebody did a run, did a yum update all, and ah. But with Ansible AWX, you can see that. But you can also uh, schedule those tasks. And the whole idea of Ansible is that you do this very often, so you trust it. And if it's not in your playbook, then it's wrong. And, um, and one of the main benefits that we had, oh, so you would watch schedule task, I had it, and it's of course free. And we Dutchies like things that are free. <laughs> and um, what, why is this so, was this so, in, in, in so an important tool for us is that, especially in post-production, um, you, you want every machine to be exactly the same configured. Have the same driver version, same Final Cut version, same OS version, same, 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 same. 
Before that, we always had the problem that people said, it worked in edit set 11 and not in the set where I'm now. And apparently somebody did, because it always has a deadline, oh, let me upgrade the driver and see if it works now. But, um, so the sets were not the same, but now they were the same. And the great thing about Ansible is, is if somebody updated the driver and Ansible runs over it again, it says, hey, you've got a newer version, I'm gonna remove that version and install my version again. And that's re really, really important for us. And um, also what you can do with Ansible is something that they call orchestration. And uh, that's very handy for when you, uh, when you upgrade all your servers on OS, for example, at the same time. So you could say, okay, upgrade these servers because we had one, two, upgrade these servers with it. Try first one client to upgrade, and if that succeed, upgrade the next one. If that succeed, upgrade the next one. And, um, and we use that a, a lot for deployment as well. Uh, one of the things that still aches me is that Apple decided to ditch uh, deployment through disk images. You know, when I, when, with my environment there, I had, um, when we did an upgrade, we had to upgrade everything at once because you couldn't work, start a new project on a new version of Final Cut and the next day be in another edit set on an older version of Final Cut. So everything had to be at once. And you're not going to install macOS on each and every one of those machines and just wait and happen. Hopefully it will happen. So I succeeded in making a script that I could build images from APFS volumes and Finally, we deployed it that way, so every machine had an Ansible user that we used for the Ansible connection. And then let Ansible do the magic while we drank some coffee, and afterwards we're done. It saved us a huge amount of time. Um, I'm going to show you how we used it, it's simple YAML. For example, this, uh, there was another file called install DMG that we called every time, but I think everybody knows exactly what happens here. So, you got an app, Final Cut Pro, we want version 10.4.6, and we want it to be in the applications directory, and the GMG is located in Ansible's home. That's it. And then you have a list of all the file, software that you want. And um, they have tags as well, so you don't have to run the whole entire playbook again. So give me everything that's related to Final Cut Pro, for example. If you install Final Cut Pro, you need to install the supplemental content files, so your, your drivers and extra codecs, uh, which you have, uh, must download through the software update system. So um, you could also tag that with Final Cut Pro because it actually should be tagged Final Cut Pro. And the become true uh, thing is something, it's just saying do this as root, use sudo. And um, what we also did, um, for example, this, this would copy a script, launch apps to that location with this owner's staff and uh, permissions, only when somebody had 10, 14, 4, 5, for example. And if somebody would change that script or change the permissions or in whatever way, Ansible would see it and set it right again. So you don't have to write any if statements, Ansible's doing that already for you. See, I'm, I'm excited about this. So uh, we use it for all these sort of things, for a service as well. And uh, what I'm about to tell you, we, I'm using that for our, our cloud as well. And it's very popular, but you can actually use it for Macs. Um, and this is awesome as well. Configure UMask, you need to re reboot for that, but Ansible knows that, okay, I'm gonna reboot and then wait until you get it back up again, and then I'm gonna continue. That's those little things that make your life easier. Uh, this is uh, a screenshot of, of uh, the website, where, what I talked about. This is actually our, uh, from our PostLab cloud now. And uh, this is something, for example, a certificate renewal. Uh, we use a Let's Encrypt certificate, a wildcard certificate. And as soon as that gets renewed, Ansible would see it, deploy it to every server that needs it, and reboot or restart the necessary services. And it will automatically notify me in Slack as soon as that happened. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, all, all this is obviously in Git configurations, but Ansible would, before it would run, of the AWX, before it would run a playbook, it would simply do another pool, so it has the latest repository and then run. Okay, so 
now it comes to talk about PostLab. <laughs> this was the background story. We had a problem, a, a huge problem about, uh, in our environment there. And it mainly had to do with structure. And um, it was a folder structure problem. And we had uh, a, sp a couple of specific rules or, or things that we wanted. And the first one is very normal, I guess. You're only allowed to throw stuff away that's yours. The only problem is that when you want to collaborate, that's a pain in the butt. And uh, therefore, we always needed an editor and a TV maker together in the same set. That was the, how we thought of that. We, th we thought at the beginning that it was a good idea, but it turned out it was a really bad idea. So what happened was um, that it created another problem. Yeah, there it is. You had a Final Cut Pro library problem, and Final Cut Pro libraries on the sand that's meant for video is not a good idea. Libraries are SQL-like databases, and um, we had our sands configured for um, for video. And uh, the main problem was this: actually, you needed write permissions to open a library. Back in the days of Final Cut Pro Seven, you could open a document with only read permissions. But everybody needed write permissions to only see what the editor had did, had done. So what you get is that everybody needed to make a copy into their own directory. And uh, this is what I meant, the library's database. And everybody needed to make a copy of their own in order to, up, uh, to open the library. And then you get something like this. So directory hell. Um, these are the folders of our TV shows. These are the folders of our uh, TV users. And we got a folder of each and every editor. Now, somebody said, comes up to you and says, I want you to finish that project. Let's start browsing. And then you find a project, and you don't know if it's the latest version. You don't know what has changed. And you don't know where the materials are. And this was becoming a pain and a pain. And um, it was simply wasn't built for collaboration. Nobody knew what was where. And then you had the, the problem for users. They had permission problems, because they could not collaborate the way they wanted. So we had a couple of very important TV shows that would say, OK, we're going to place ACLs on, your, uh, on, on some directories, and we'll solve the problem that way. Don't do it. They suck. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was, that was a hell. <laughs> yeah. And we had to manage those exceptions. And uh, that's, it's really hard. You would, you would end up with files with a lot of ACLs on top of them, which wouldn't perform anymore in Final Cut, because Final Cut didn't need what, 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 what permissions. So we wanted actually a, a permission model based on simple POSIX rights and only that. So. We basically got a lot of library cache junk and madness going on. I want to show you an example which looks pretty organized and neat. This was one of our examples of uh, ex uh, exceptions. And um, so you see, uh, it says they're done. Klaar in Dutch is done. And this was the show for every day. But still, you don't know if that's really done. Because sometimes they say done too. Or, you know, is this really the final version? Has somebody still not copied it? And then uh, below there is a nice uh, a text file with comments. Yeah, back in, the, back in, the, the, uh, in the 90s, perhaps, that would be useful. But come on, a text file with comments in a directory and hoping people would read that, that's a bit old. So, uh, around that time, a couple of years before that, I started using Git. And then we chose GitLab as our main um, on-premise uh, Git solution. So the idea was pretty, came there, like, what if we got our libraries from our SAN and put them in GitLab? And why GitLab? First of all, we're Dutch, <laughs> sporting it. <laughs> No, um, I was thinking the tools that GitLab offers are exactly the same tools editors need. 
They want version control, though they don't know what, they don't know yet that yet. Uh, they can easily share uh, their libraries with other users and say exactly what type of sharing, only reading, on, uh, or are you allowed to throw stuff away, that sort of thing. You've got issue management. You've got, uh, uh, so they could actually hand over to do task instead of hoping that somebody would read a comment file inside a directory. And um, so you, you know what, what, what GitLab does. Uh, and it was open source and free. And uh, GitLab allows you to have it on premise and it, it connected with our uh, AD. So uh, it was a real easy choice to make. And uh, I love also that it's open source, for the, the core is open source, and every 22nd of the month they're releasing new features inside of it. And um, their omnibus package on Linux is awesome. I have never seen a better uh, Linux application managed like this before. You simply say yum install GitLab CE or EE, depending on what version you want, it will install it. And uh, you only have one config file, and every, every time you, need, you change that, you do a reconfigure, and it, it just works. They handle the backups. They handle deleting backups after a certain amount of days. And uh, everything that in the backup is in a li nice little tarball. It's really easy to manage. Um, but then, so I had this great idea, but my boss said no. <laughs> And I pitched it again and pitched it again, but they said no. Because I don't know if uh, I, I've mentioned this before to a couple of people here, but I remember before I started using Git, I thought, I have my shit pretty together with all my scripts. I know where they are, and I think they're on the latest version. And uh, as soon as I started using Git after a couple of days, and I thought, how could I have ever worked without this? And but you don't know that until you're using it. And uh, so I thought, I've got to make this real simple for my, uh, for my bosses. And, um, and the idea kept popping up back up in my head. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to make it in my spare time. And uh, as soon as I had a working demo, I showed my bosses it one more time. And if they didn't want to use it, I, that was fine. And I uh, went on for it with myself, for myself. And uh, then luckily they said, okay, they saw it working, they saw the, the, the concept and could agree that it um, saw, saw how it would work. And uh, so I was allowed to work for it in my boss's time, but I got obviously my hours back. In, well, obviously in Europe, that's obviously. <laughs> and uh, I also made a deal that it would become open source because I thought it was too good to keep it for ourselves. And... Uh, it looks a little bit like this. I'm going to demo it in a while. Usually my demos uh, are somehow failing. but um, So it's basically a, a Git client for Final Cut Pro users. That's basically what it does. And I've learned through the years that we are working with it, uh, editors really think they know a lot about computers, but they really don't. And uh, so we had to make it really, really simple for them. And so you only have a button, start editing. It will open up Final Cut Pro. They could work. As soon as they're done, they have to uh, write a commit message. And I even have a, a warning. If you only put in one word, you get a nice notification. You can do better than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every editor saw that one. <laughs> and, uh, and then commit. So these are uh, everything with a star is a version for them, and which they could revert back to. That was all a complete new concept for them. And uh, we had documents for voiceover lyrics. And we had, uh, or uh, translations. We had, for example, we had a, sh a show which was recorded in uh, Iran, I think. And somebody had to translate everything, uh, what everything was saying, because the editor didn't have a clue where to put the cut. So, um, but imagine that you had to do that another time for, uh, for another Later, it gets rebroadcasted again. With this, now you have everything together. You have everything in one place. And that's, that was the goal. Um, so finally, we had every TV show in it. And editors, finally, when they grasped the idea of version control, that's something that we want, they, come, they came to us from, please put this TV show in it. I'm editing that next week. Could we do it? 
Uh, before, uh, could we put them in uh, post lab uh, before that? And we changed the folder structure on the sound to only seven per show. And there was a, um, like an export folder, material folder, no longer user based. And the permissions model was only POSSEX. We, we decided to go for groups, a group model. So either each TV show had normal, regular users, they were allowed to read everywhere. And you had an admin group, and they were allowed to write everywhere as well. And they were the ones responsible for cleaning up. And that's really easy for us, because have you ever tried with uh, 76 editors, could you please clean up your folder? And now you had only two people that were responsible. Um, and uh, GitLab has an excellent permission model, way better than uh, GitHub, I think, because GitLab supports subgroups and multiple subgroups. And each subgroup can have its own permission. So you could actually say to one episode, this editor, an external editor, is only allowed to work on that single episode. That, worked, that was really handy for us. Um, and every TV show could have a, its very own custom workflow. And that was really important. And we had one, um, we had a children's program called Checkpoint, and they did a lot of experiments, like crazy experiments. So could we do blow up a car and see what happens, like that sort of stuff. And they would record these experiments, and every experiment was a library. And when the, uh, uh, the, the final editor had to uh, get a list, okay, this, uh, ep this episode, this TV show will contain the following experiments. And he had to browse through all the folders, looking for that experiment, call every editor, where is it? Is this, where is the material? And uh, it saved him about four hours each episode because he would just simply open, ah, here's the experiment, open, 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 and it will come back again. Um, so, what happened next? Uh, as soon as I released um, PostLab uh, to the public, that was after almost a year and a half after since we've used it, um, uh, I released it open source, but it's, I was the only guy working on it and mainly had to do it because it was an exotic language. But um, the, the, the main, a lot of editors were really excited. And, um, but um, editors can help along with programming. And, um, but it, it kind of took off and it got me invited to speak to you guys here. So, <laughs> never thought of that. <laughs> Yeah, and um, so uh, quite some coverage and uh, uh, Felipe, uh, I got in touch with Felipe who's working here as well now and he wanted to be involved with the project so uh, it, it took off and uh, th there came a point that I thought, you know what, I want to work closer to home. I have uh, three small tr children and uh, I don't want to travel that much. So I took another job closer to home. And, uh, but in the meantime, uh, a company called Hatch contacted me. And Hatch is uh, doing backup software for video uh, professionals. So they uh, do really simple, easy, fast up offloading of your materials and uh, to multiple destinations with a verified checksum. So you really know I've got my stuff and I can, I can wipe this card now. And um, they do is also some cataloging and actually Matt got us in touch together it's, uh, because they, uh, they work uh, from Amsterdam. So, hey, let's chat. And we had two long chats and uh, really got excited about this could work. So we, we could include PostLab within uh, the Hatch family. So uh, uh, as of three and a half months now, I work uh, for Hedge, and the other company, uh, other job that I had to work close to home, I just worked there for seven days, and I said, "Sorry, guys, <laughs> I'm gonna." And I missed the video. In, uh, I missed the video in, uh, industry as well. It's a really awesome community to be part of, and um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, we've got some great plans, and I'm uh, meeting great new friends, and um, um, yeah, so. Open source could also be, have a happy ending, you know? I just <laughs> want to put that out there.
Okay, so let me show you basically what it does. And let me first check if this internet still works because we all know that you get kicked out after once in a while. Um, I'll show you a demo on one of our uh, slower test servers in Amsterdam. So this is basically it. You, um, one of the things that we had to do is, firstly, I thought, uh, you know what? People could use GitLab front end, create a project, copy the link, paste it in the application. Editors could do that, right? What's, uh... <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have to speak uh, editorial or something. Um, but this is uh, the way it looks now. We, we're, we're building a cloud, so people don't have to install GitLab or anything else. You just have a username, password, and you, and you have a team. And this is, uh, for example, my team of uh, my own folders here. You can create all these kinds of folders, and you can see what's actually uh, inside of it. I have that project open here. And uh, so you get your activity stream. You can see exactly who did what. Of course, you guys all know Git, so I'm not talking new stuff. But for editors, this is revolutionary. We've got some uh, simple uh, issue management stuff going on here. And uh, some commenting. Your documents, simply double click and drag and drop. Um, and of obviously your libraries. So uh, you can open in read only, which is very handy. When some, we have a sort of bin locking in here. So when another editor is editing, you see here, hey, Felipe is now working on this project on this machine. And here's his phone number in case you want to reach him. So you can't work on it now, but you can open in read only because we can not merge within Final Cut Pro. It's uh, all this database stuff uh, going on. So. Um, as I mentioned before, everything with a star is uh, a version that you can return to. You can uh, make a description, put some status comments in it, and let's work on this one. I'm not an editor, luckily. So uh, what happens now is Final Cut Pro opens on my other screen. <laughs> so let me grab that one, pull it back here. Look at this awesome edit. I made just a nice cut. So you know what, I, uh, let me import something. Uh, London, it's a bit closer to home. So I'll drag that up there. Nice. Uh, uh, that's look nice, lovely. So as you can see, I've been editing. When I return to PostLab, I say he would have changed. Uh, so one word, and then you can do better than that. <laughs> OK, uh, edit London. And it will close the library in Final Cut. It will also um, close the recents. Otherwise, they might work on it and open Final Cut again and say, oh, here's the project, and we'll start working like that. But then it's not on the version control. So uh, uh, we do that as well. And it's hard to work on two screens while the other one is behind you. Now. I, I, I suspect that you <laughs> 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 Oh, I should have added that video. Where is it coming from? So, <laughs> okay, and um, what you, you can do all kinds of things. Uh, what you also have is uh, uh, importing of existing libraries. You also handle uh, templates of libraries. So a TV show can set up a simple template and let their intern create all the libraries, put all the media in place. And uh, as soon as the editor is ready, it finds his library exactly the way he wants it, with the right keywords, with the right setup, that sort of stuff. And um, so, uh, well, I could obviously go back to this version here. Yes, I do want that. And the great thing is, of course, that you all know that it's Git, so I could also go back to the London version again if I want to. And this is uh, for... Uh, uh, so if I open it again, you see London is gone. It will even have the, the marker of the playhead at the same location as you left it. And um, 
So we've got great plans for, for it. We obviously want to support other uh, nearline editors like Premiere or DaVinci. And we're even thinking of uh, Logic and Sound uh, and Pro Tools. So you have everything of one project in one repository, basically. So I've been talking way too long. Uh, thank you for having me. And I just want to thank Matt very well. Matt, you're doing a great job with this conference. And, uh, what? Who, me? Yeah, you're doing a great job. <laughs>